Let's Get Down to Business is presented by Bravo, the marketing arm of Ash Brokerage Corporation, the practice enhancement company. All this week, it's our holiday tribute to charitable giving. And on today's show, charitable giving techniques. And with me today, certified financial planner and nationally recognized charitable giving expert, Dan Nagito. Happy holidays, everyone. I'm Steve Savant, syndicated financial columnist and contributing author to Backroom Technician. Let's get down to business. Welcome to the show, Dan. Nice to be back, Steve. Day four is right. Wow, we're talking about four days. I, you know, we, we again, I want to exhort our audience. If you're coming into our show on Thursday and you haven't seen Monday through Wednesday show, I think you need to go back out and watch them in succession so that you have a really good learning uh, a curve. You know, really it'll help you adopt some of the basic format. Because a lot of, for a lot of people, this is their first pass through charitable giving. Yeah. And we're going through our expert. And Dan has written a book that I think if you say, Steve, I'd like to dip my toe into this. I'm enjoying this week's series. I want you to get his book, The Power of Leveraging Charitable Remainder Trust. The Charitable Remainder Trust is so hot right now. And I think you're going to find it flexible. And I thought this was going to be a lot harder to understand. Dan, you made this easy to understand. That's because I'm a genius. <laughs> well, okay, no self-deprecation <laughs> here. Let's talk a bit, you know, we, we talk about all kinds, there's so many things to talk about, but I want to talk about two main ones today and bust them out, spend a little time on it. I know that our industry is completely full of acronyms. Oh, yeah. Oh, and this is a big one. We're talking about Charitable Remainder Unit Trust and its Wealth Replacement Kissing Cousin. Now, the reason I'm doing this is because we talked about life insurance yesterday. I, I thought this would be a good way segue into this. Mm -hmm. Crits, crats, cruts, we have so much language. Yeah, we do. Right, and I, I sometimes I get lost in it. Walk us through charitable remainder trusts. Okay, so there, trust. there really is two types of charitable remainder trusts that really are important. Cruts and crats, charitable remainder unit trust, charitable remainder annuity trust. We'll do annuity trust after we do this one. The unit trust is a vehicle that allows you to take an asset, they, they work the same, they're both qualified under Section 664 of the Internal Revenue Code. So beyond all things, you have really great black and white tax code. There's no gray area with this stuff. Mm -hmm. Kratz and Crutz work under the same section of the code. But a crud is a unit trust, and, uh, and as a unit trust, what that means is you're getting your income stream based upon a fixed percentage it's a little bit confusing. It's a fixed percentage of the fair market value of the trust as determined on the last day of the taxable year. So I put $100,000 into my charitable remainder unit trust. I get an income tax deduction based upon the $100,000 in my age and the AFR. It really revolves around the income stream. When I put my $100,000 in a unit trust, my investment advisor, and I can direct him because I'm the trustee of my own trust, my investment advisor then is going to manage that money for me. It could be in stocks, bonds, mutual funds, it could be in whatever you want. It doesn't matter what goes on during the course of the year, but on the last day of the tax year, I'm going to take the high and low value of that trust. And that value is what I'm going to use to determine my income for the next year. So this is 2013. I put $100,000 in. Uh, I'm going to take a 6% distribution from my trust, which would be $6,000. That's my distribution for 2013. For 2014, that $100,000 has been uh, invested. At the end of the year, in December, whatever that trust value is worth, that percentage, 6% of that fair market value, is going to be my income for 2014. Mm -hmm. Then we do the same thing in It doesn't matter if it goes up or down, that's well, the value. That, you know, that's, that's the key then, because if it goes up, my distribution, my income stream is going to go up. If it goes down, my income stream is going to go down. So I, I am participating, gives me a chance to participate in the mm -hmm. growth of the trust. But it's the fixed percentage of the fair market value of the trust as determined on the last day of the year. Then I'm going to get that income for the following year. Uh, the, other the other feature of a unit trust is that I could, um, with a unit trust, I could continually add money to that. So if I want to put in, uh, a lot of people do this over time. They want to make this like almost like a retirement plan. I do this for doctors as a retirement mm. plan, supplemental retirement plan. I'll put 25000 in this year, 25000 in next year, 25000 on and on and on and on. It's always going into the same bucket mm -hmm. because the bucket's value is determined at the end of the year. So I can continue to make contributions to that. So, so if, you, if I'm doing ongoing annual contributions 
there's going to be a certain fair market value deduction that I'll be able to take that specific year for that right. contribution. Right. Now I'm receiving money coming back out of this, as you said, like in your example, six percent, six thousand right. dollars. Am I, is that taxable to me then at six grand? And if it is, where what taxable Income is coming out of a charitable remainder trust is taxed in a very unique way. It's called four-tier accounting. Uh, four-tier accounting means I pay income tax, ordinary income, when I, as the cash flow comes out of my trust, I pay ordinary income uh, mm -hmm. based upon the amount of revenue generated to the trust was ordinary income. In, mm -hmm. Ordinary income to the extent there was ordinary income, dividend income beyond that, capital gain, return of principal, tax-free, then return of principal. Ordinary capital gain, uh, uh, tax-free return of principal. When I'm looking at this, does it break that out for the owner so that he's filing this at the end of the year? Yeah, the administrator should do that. For okay, so, so why is this a popular tactic? This is a big technique and a huge tactic. Why is this so popular? Well, it's, it's popular because it's, there's, there's a degree of flexibility in that and participation in the market, as opposed to an annuity trust where that's a fixed mm -hmm. income stream. For the f annuity trust is a fixed dollar amount, and it's not flexible in that it's simple, but you can only make one deposit to one trust and you're done. So this is more flexible. When we come back from the break, we're going to talk about charitable planning techniques. And don't forget, you can go out to Dan's site and buy his book, The Power of Leveraging the Charitable Remainder Trust, at www.najito.com. And while you're out online, sign up for your own 30-day free trial offer from Backroom Technician. Just go out to brtnow.com forward slash trial sign up dot ASPX. We'll be right back after the break. Back in the day, life insurance professionals were called field underwriters. Then, carriers trained their field force in the basics of life insurance underwriting. Today, the insurance industry doesn't educate the agent population as they once did. But now, you can have the informed risk guide at your fingertips so you can illustrate a reasonable rate class for your life insurance prospects. Just request your copy of the informed risk guide at downtobusiness.ashbrokerage.com. It's free from Ash Brokerage, the practice enhancement company. Well, welcome back, everyone. I'm Steve Savant with Dan Nagito. And remember, you can watch all our episodes of Let's Get Down to Business and my weekly consumer show, Steve Savant's Money, the name of the game, right out at ashbrokerage.com. Just click on the show logo right on the home page. And just a heads up, before moving forward with any of the ideas on our show, always consult your tax advisor, legal counsel, as well as your broker-dealer compliance department. Well, let's get down to business. We're continuing our discussions on charitable planning techniques. Well, Dan, I want to talk a little bit. Before I get into the second segment, which we're going to talk about Kratz. Right. This takes some intense administration, and, and I noticed that you really, some years back, in, just said, we got to build this whole thing out. Yeah, you know, I've been doing this for, uh, of my 35 years in a business, I've been doing this for 25 of those years. Um, and, and one thing we discovered early on is that if you, the design looks great. Charitable remainder trust, whether it's a crat or a crut, married to a life insurance policy is an ideal scenario for a number of planning settings. But it would always unravel when we get it to the administrative piece because some attorney, or and not the denigrated attorneys or CPAs, but someone would show up with our plan and their job was to poke a hole in it and to talk about something they know nothing about. Hmm. And so we figured the best way to fix that was to become our own administrative piece. So we built our whole turnkey operation where we do the design, mm -hmm. implementation, uh, and the management and the administration mm -hmm. by, by creating a, uh, an administrative piece of, of the puzzle, which includes uh, providing the prototype legal document so that when a client comes and says, okay, I like this idea, well, we're not attorneys, but the IRS gives you the document you're supposed to use. It's mm -hmm. on IRS.gov. So we print out the document. We make it uh, nice with the client's name on it and stamp prototype on it, and it goes to the attorney. So the real document that the attorney needs to use mm -hmm. is, is done that way. And then going forward to do the qualification for the tax deduction, bypass the capital gains tax, and to keep it compliant we do all of the uh, accounting in our operation as well. And we charge the client a nominal fee to do that because we really don't want outside people getting involved. So we charge a nominal fee to do the administration. We debit the trust 
client doesn't write us a check. It comes out of the trust assets to pay for administrative fees. Mm. And we give the client his tax deduction work, funnel it all back to the client's CPA, so the CPA is still in the loop. So we do the illegal work for the attorney, let the attorney do the document, our document. Uh, and we do the tax work, we feed that to the CPA so that the CPA can put mm -hmm. it on your tax return, K-1s and support documentation, and that all stays in house. And mm -hmm. so the client f forces an annual review, the client loves dealing with, the, with, with an operation where he knows he can pick up the phone and get a quick answer, and we know what we're talking about, which believe me, <laughs> it's a game changer in this business. Well, I like the idea that the turnkey, a lot of our advisors are going to go, I'd rather just deal with one person, oh, yeah. single shingle. Now, when we're talking about crats, just to move back into where, this is a little different than a crud, all right, but but basic format. Well, Same. I like, I see, I like doing the crut first because there's so many moving pieces to mm -hmm. a crut. And a crat, as we, you know, we closed out that last segment, I said, you know, it's far more restrictive, but it's also very, very simple. And in fact, I use the CRAT almost exclusively in my book because I, I wanted to get by the whole uh, present value of the fair market value, mm -hmm. the whole nine, it's crazy. I wanted to give the client something very simple to understand, then we could move into more aggressive planning later on. But to separate the two, again, they're both qualified under 664, they both give you the same tax deduction, they both give you four-tier accounting, uh, it's all pretty much the same, but the difference is on the income stream. Mm -hmm. With a CRAT, when you create the trust, you tell the trustee, which is you, that you want a fixed dollar amount based upon a, a percentage. For example, I put $100,000 in my trust, I want that same 6%, but that 6% of $100,000 is $6,000. That's the annuity payment. You're gonna get a $6,000 check from that trust for the rest of the trust duration, whether it's your lifetime or a term of years. It doesn't matter what the trust assets do. If the trust assets can be go up, they can go down, you're gonna get your 6,000. Mm -hmm. You said in the last segment how, you know, if the trust goes up, I go up, and if the trust goes down, I, my income goes down. Well, in this, up or down doesn't mean anything to you. It's a fixed dollar amount, mm -hmm. which is an annuity payment. Uh, now, what's nice about that is that in a market like like the one we're in, where you know interest rates may be at a low, well the trust may earn five percent, but we're taking income out at six percent, so the trust value can actually decrease over time, mm -hmm. which is perfectly okay. It has to pass a couple of tests, but it's perfectly okay for the trust value to go down. So at least what what that does for me, especially when I'm using a term of years, like a ten-year trust. It gives me an absolute definitive knowledge of how much income I'm going to get from that trust. And the other answer, and the other part of that is that the charity is going to get what's left. It's not no longer a participant. The charity is going to get, if, if it earns greater return, the charity is going to get more money. If it earns less return, it's going to get less money. And the other separator between an annuity trust and a CRAT is with annuity trust, you can add to it. With a CRAT, since it's all annuity payments, it's once and done. So if I want to do $25,000 a year, mm -hmm. I have to do a series of CRATs, which is nothing mm -hmm. wrong with that, uh, but, it's, but you cannot add to an existing CRAT. Sounds simpler and easier to do, but it ha doesn't have the flexibility. Right, exactly right. Okay, well, not, just last before we get out of here, I, I'm looking at, this seems to be pretty popular. It's the central piece of your book. Right. So is this, would you say, one of the big mainstay techniques that you use? Uh, it, for me, yes, it is. But we use unit trust too. I mean, there's so much mm -hmm. flexibility in all this stuff. It's really a powerful tool. Well, that's our show for today. Remember, you can read all my online news commentary, advisor blogs, and articles on Producers Web, as well as my answers to consumer questions on the insurance library. You can also view all our past episodes on our on demand section at located at downtobusiness.ashbrokerage.com. So follow me on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn, or just email me. Steves.Savant at ashbrokerage.com. And remember, you could be wiser as an Ash Brokerage advisor. Happy holidays, everyone.